that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to Him. That is a warning. That's a warning. The book is full of promises, but it's also full of warnings. It wants us to be clear about things. Because we want to make sure we can at last do this. Now, I'm going to tell you that my, my experience, the gentle truth about that, is I was absolutely ready to utterly surrender myself to God when I took the third step. Have I stayed in the third step? Have I lived in the third step ever since? Oh, no. God knows that. But I always, but I meant it when I did it. I meant that from this point forward, I'm going to try to form this new relationship with you. I'm really going to try. I'm going to try to live on a different basis. I'm really open-minded to this. I know my way doesn't work. I don't know if this is going to work out between us, God, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready to stay the course. For once in my life, I'm ready to do this and not constantly be looking for the progress. I'm ready to try to live on a different basis. And if you do that for me, if you take this away from me, if you show me how to live, I'll serve you and your kids. And I'm asking for that opportunity. I'm not demanding it. I'm offering myself. And what I found with the God of my understanding is that offer is always answered. It's always been answered by the men I've sponsored and the men I've known in Alcoholics Anonymous. The book says that God doesn't make terms too tough on those that honestly seek him. And that's been my experience. And the wonderful thing is, over the years, I have had to reseek God. I've had to go to God like a child looking for an apology, you know, offering an apology because I've been away. I've walked away from God without knowing I did it. My ego has stepped in. The busyness of life has stepped in. My fear has stepped in. My resentments have stepped in. And they've cut me off from God without me knowing. These things are subtle and they can drift into our life without us really knowing until they've taken root. And I've had to draw those lines in the sand. And I've had to become teachable again. And I've had to get down with a sponsor and do step work again. And I've had to hit my knees in a real concerted manner and ask God to you know, take me back. I know I've been away a little bit. And I can do that in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can do that attending meetings, working with men, doing things like this. I can be cut off from God uh, if I let up on my spiritual program. I just seem to have a natural ability to run on self. You know, I remember uh, my sponsor trying to teach me about the third step and my fear. <laughs> this is so alcoholic. You know, what's going to happen to me? You know, where's my fun? You know, I'm going to leave the fun aspect of my life up to God because I got this idea that God's not going to be interested in me having a good time. And, uh, and my sponsor said, you know what? You need to put your whole mental thought life into trying to figure out what God would have you do and how you can help other people, period. Because you don't have to worry about having a good time, Don. You're hardwired for that. <laughs> whatever, whatever little time is left over, for you to think about having a good time, you will get so much more out of that than all the hours you spend trying to help others. Because you're just naturally so selfish, you're always going to, don't worry about yourself. You'll be taken care of. Your selfishness will always make sure that that's taken. And it's true. It's absolutely true. It is natural for me to just, I'm waiting for the day. This is the best way I can put it. And I hope it happens soon. It hasn't happened yet where I wake up in the morning and I'm not thinking about me. Now, I may be able to change that gear pretty quickly now, but I'll tell you, the first thing I do every morning when I wake up is I think about me. I change it pretty quick and think about God, but it's always me. I'm always the, I'm the last thing I think of and the first thing I think of. So uh, my selfishness and self-centeredness is down at the core of my being, and it probably always will be. And the wonderful thing is I found a way that I can live a productive, happy life and get the fruits of having a relationship with God as I understand him. I mean, it's the greatest relationship I've ever had is the relationship I have with God. I am so glad that I didn't miss this. I'm so glad that no matter what happens in my life, I know I'm going to be okay. And I mean that. And that doesn't mean that everything's going to go my way because it hasn't. And I've been in some scary situations in my life where because God was there with me, I just sat back and I went, well, this sucks. This isn't even the seemingly bad. This is the bad. And, uh, I said, you know what, God, you know, thanks for everything to this point. Whatever happens, I'll be okay with that too. And I was able to keep walking. And the interesting thing about when these storms come in our life, I don't know if you, if this, if you identify with this, but in the past, 
when I would have a storm in my life, you know, in business or in the relationship, everything sucked. You know what I mean? Everything sucked. Every, now my whole life is crap because one aspect of my life isn't hitting on all eight cylinders. The funny thing about living the spiritual life is it gives you perception for value what's really going on. Things can be tough at work. doesn't mean I have to be a jerk at home. Things can be tough at home. I don't have to be a jerk at work. I can be feeling a little cut off in AA, you know, feeling a little uncomfortable in my normal meetings. doesn't mean i got to go take it out on the guys I sponsor. And it's not about what the psychiatrists call compartmentalizing. It's about really understanding it's only one aspect of your life. I don't have to lose the beauty and the joy and the happiness of my whole life because maybe my health is bad for a short period of time or my finances are bad for a short period of time or my marriage is tough for a short period of time. That's what God gives me because I'm not running the show. When I'm running the show, this is my view of the world. And whatever I'm looking at looks really big. That's the hugest water glass I've ever seen in my life, you know? (laughs) That's how my problems look. God's view is, is you know, I'm, I'm trying to look through the eyes of, of God that are all powerful and all loving. It just opens up my perception. Let's take a break. I'm still Don. I'm still an alcoholic. Okay. <laughs> all right. Moving on to the fourth step. Made a searching and fearless moral inventories of, of ourselves. Uh, the principle here is soul searching. And before we get into the fourth step, we have another warning in the big book. Uh, and it's really important. It's probably the most important thing about the third step. And uh, it says, uh, next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, and they're talking about the third step there, it could have little permanent effect unless at once, followed by a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things that have, in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom. We had to get down the causes and conditions. So the idea, and, and, you know, and the truth of the matter is, is I got stuck between three and four, and it wasn't for a long time. It felt like forever. It was probably a couple of months before I actually started writing my fourth step after I uh, finished my third step. And uh, I just know for me, uh, in that very short time, I got weird. You know, I, uh, I had, and I don't know if it was the, my, my paranoid about the, the peer pressure within my, my sobriety family, and, you know, because it gets to the point where you, you start walking in meetings, everybody knows you haven't started your fourth step yet. And they're going, you start your fourth step yet? You start your fourth step yet? And uh, and you go, you want to make the list, you know, and because uh, <laughs> you're close. And uh, but the book is very clear, and we're talking about the book's directions, and it says at once, and it's warning us that the third step, although it's completely crucial and it's vital, it's not going to have any permanent effect. And that was my experience. I mean, I, I I'm telling you, after I did the third step and understood it and started to bring that into my day, trying to try to think, change my thinking, you know, and it's not about subtracting things from your life as much as adding things, you know. We still get to ask the question, you know, what do I do, but we just change it a little bit. What would God have me do, you know, and then the actions are based on that answer, and if we don't have the willingness, we pray for the willingness, because having the, you know, this, this, this God's will information that comes from us, and we go and we share it with a sponsor is terrific, we still have to have the willingness to go and take the action. And that was really difficult for me. I had to have a sponsor's help with this, you know, after I would pray about something. I'd go, I got to tell you, you know, the, I know what to do. I just don't want to do it. And, uh, and my sponsor was great about not yelling at me and not saying it, you know, well, go get drunk. You know, he'd say, well, you know, you need to pray. You need to pray for the willingness. If you feel it's God's will for you, and I happen to agree with that, you need to pray for the willingness. And staying in that process, and that's the whole thing, is to stay in the process. Because this stuff isn't like throwing a light switch. And sometimes we look at the big book, and uh, because it's a, there's a very directional nature of the writing, uh, it sounds like we do this, this happens. We do this, this happens. I mean, there's promises all through the book. And sometimes, you know, I've had sponsees take a step, and they know what the promises are supposed to be associated with the step, and they'll call me the next day. <laughs> hey, man, my fears haven't fallen from me, you know. <laughs> I've been ripped off, <laughs> you know. So we need to really understand that these first three steps that we've taken 
we're now ready to start finding out about the things that have been blocking us out from God. We're really starting to take some very definitive actions, and there's going to be a lot of action from here on forward. And the interesting thing about the steps that uh, a lot of men that I've talked to about this identify with this, when we go through the steps for the first time or even the second time or when we start teaching them to the men that we sponsor the first few times, there's a very uh, compartmentalized nature to the step, particularly when you take them for the first time. I'm on step one, I'm on step two, I'm on step three. You know, and, it, and we don't really see the connection sometimes between them. And what happens after you work the steps, You know, because the steps are our design for living, and after you work these steps and you get into 10, 11, and 12 on a daily basis and you're doing that, what, what actually happens is, is the 12 steps of recovery metamorphosize and they become what the book refers to as the design for living. And those walls between the steps come down, and you start seeing really clearly how everything's interlinked linked together, how the first three steps are completely interlinked with the rest of the steps. But, there, but we find out a lot of things in those first three steps. We find out the nature of our problem, and we find out what the solution is. And now we're going to go, and we're going to start taking action to get in line with that solution. So we're going to get down to causes and conditions, like the book says. Therefore, we started on a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking commercial inventory is a fact-finding, fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the goods to get rid of uh, the unsaleable goods, to get rid of them promptly without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. And it's an important word, values. Now, we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure, being convinced that self manifested in various ways of what had defeated us. We considered its common manifestations. What we're doing here is we're going to take three separate inventories within the fourth step. It's the inventory process, but contained within that are three separate inventories. We're going to take a resentment inventory. We're going to take a fear inventory. And we're going to take a personal relations or sex list inventory. Now, the reason that resentments, fear, and sex are the three items that we decided to work with and Bill decided to work with is that these are the three areas that our self-will manifests itself most identically throughout all of us. That within these three inventories, we should be able to find out the true value of the way we're living our lives and the way that we go about doing things. So we're going to take these three, but keep in mind we're back to that word, which is self. Being convinced that self was what had defeated us, now we're going to consider its common manifestations. Okay, self, my self-will is what defeated me. Well, how does it defeat me? In what areas? What does it look like? That's what we're going to do. We start with the resentment. The big book refers to this as the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. Okay, not a lot of discussion needed there. Number one offender. Uh, I would say that uh, they put it first in the inventory process for a reason. It's going to tell us why they put it first and why it kills more of us than anything else. Well, from its stem, all forms of spiritual disease. Not some forms, but all forms of spiritual disease. For we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. Here's the promise. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. And we all know that a lot of us spend a lot of time in sobriety. We get sober. It's completely normal. I was, I was completely, it's hard to tell looking at me now, but I was addicted to working out. You know, I was down below 8% body fat. And I'm telling you, I don't think that's a bad thing to do when you're nuts. You know, it's a lot better than the alternatives, you know. And, uh, but the truth is, uh, true serenity, where you feel like life's okay no matter what's going on. And I heard one old timer say the true definition of serenity is when, Stuff happens in your life that's maybe crappy, and you go, oh, well, and you mean it? He goes, that's serenity. And I didn't understand what he meant for a lot of years, and I do today. It's that ability, what we call living life on life's terms, where things are allowed to happen in God's world, and it doesn't have to be the end of the universe, that it may just be all our turn in the barrel. We don't take things so damn personally anymore because we're not running the show. And it's important that this promise that we know that if we put our efforts And if we have a disease that's both spiritual and it's physical and it's mental in application, now we're not drinking, we're we're assuming that we're not drinking if we're in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if we're not drinking, we've overcome the physical part of the ailment. And uh, 
because we're not going to have the phenomenon of craving of the allergic reaction as long as we put, don't put alcohol in our system. But we've discovered that that's only one part, that abstinence is only, it's really the entrance pass into this deal, that that will have little effect to keep us sober for the long haul. It'll just make us crazy and we'll eventually drink again. Now, the problem resides mainly in our mind. So we can decide that we're going to try to straighten out our thinking, and we can put a lot of effort into that. And some of us have tried that and have had varying degrees of success with it. And we, can, we all know the difference between Alcoholics Anonymous and, and modern psychology. In modern psychology, you go in, and they'll uh, ask you questions, and they'll analyze your life, and you'll answer those questions, and they'll ask you how that makes you feel. And, uh, and what will happen is you will get some self-knowledge, and you will understand why you do what you do when you do it, so the next time you do it, you'll know why you're doing it. <laughs> well, I completely understand why I cheated on you, honey. I discovered it in the doctor's office. It's really not my fault. I have abandonment issues, so I make sure I'm never abandoned. So, uh, and in Alcoholics Anonymous, we get past that. We change. We change. And uh, the entire psychic change the way your brain works, the entire psychic change of a human being, the resurrection of a human life. Does it sound easy? It doesn't sound easy to me. There's going to be some work involved here. But it's important that we understand that if the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out physically and mentally. So if I can do one thing and get three things taken care of, I'm lazy, I'm going to go with the one thing, rather than try to work on these things individually or out of order. Page 65 in the big book, uh, we start our resentment list. They refer to it as our grudge list. They give us directions on how to do it. And uh, they give you a physical representation of what it should look like, and that's from the book. And there's a line that I've highlighted there. I highlight that in all my AA books, uh, in my uh, big books, and I make sure that when I start the inventory process with anyone I sponsor, uh, after we read the uh, information up to this point. I asked them to read that out loud for me. I said, what does that say? And they go, oh, we were usually as definite as this example. I go, what do you think that means? They go, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and I say, what you're going to write for me is going to look like this. You're not writing an autobiography. If you bring me, I got up on June 3rd, it was a foggy day. I noticed my emotions matched the weather. I will throw you out of my house. <laughs> it is a list. It is a list. I have, uh, I have been privy to some 12-step uh, workbooks that people have uh, you know, given me. So, oh, you might find this useful. And I'm like, yeah, you got to be kidding me. If anybody ever followed this and wanted to read it to me, I'd kill myself. It's like I don't have three weeks. It's, uh, and I think that we got to be careful that with this, we're, gonna, we're on a fact-finding, fact-facing mission. Let's keep it simple. Let's not louse it up and make it more complicated than it needs to be. We're writing a list, and we want our guys to write a list, so when they bring us in the fifth step, they know what they're talking about. When they go, that thing that happened with Aunt Sally, you don't need to write down everything that happened with Aunt Sally. You know what happened. You're ready for a long talk. The book tells us in the fifth step we're prepared for a long talk. So we want to make sure that we're as definite as this example and we use the column method. Now, a lot of people do other things. Uh, the old man, Clancy, uses the six, six or seven questions. I don't even know what it is. That's fine. That's not the school that, that I use. I mean, I just stick with the big book. It's easier for me because we know what I like. I can go anywhere in AA in the world and we all have the same book. I like that. I like that I can talk to you, and I can be on the phone with somebody and say, grab your book, and they can be 12 states away, and I can say, go to page 65, and we can talk about what's on there. And I don't have to explain to him some workbook that I got through Hazleton or whoever the hell it is. I like that we have that commonality. Once again, it ties me to identification. You're using the same literature I'm using. I'm going to identify with your experience because we should be having a similar experience if we're using the same literature. So that's why it's important for me. And I'm not saying anybody's got to do that. I'm just sharing my experience. We start getting our minds ready to write our resentment list. 
So when we start thinking about our resentments, we went back through our lives, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was this world and its people were often quite wrong. (laughs) (laughs) To conclude that other people were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore at ourselves. But the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Now, they're going to explain to us, and I like this about the book because it'll give us the promises with every step. It'll tell us why we should do this stuff, and it'll also tell us what's going to happen if we don't. On page 66, first paragraph, it says, It is plain that a life that includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it's fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit, the insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. So if we're to live, we have to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm are not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. So we write our first three columns, and we have fun with it, who we're resentful at, what the cause, what we think it affects, and then we're going to consider this. But we're going to consider it with an eye to how important it is that we're willing and we're open-minded about finding our part in it. We're not finding our part in it because we're moral. We're not finding our part in it because we're pushovers. We're not finding it our part in it because we think it's great that when you run our foot over with your car, we say, gee, I'm sorry, my foot was there. I hope your tire is okay. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing is we're willing to look for our part in it because we understand that in an angered state, in a resentful state, we cannot access the power that we need to live. We cannot access the power that reduces our self-centeredness or keeps us away from a drink on a daily basis. When you are angry, have you ever tried to pray? And I'm talking, I'm talking about agitated. I'm talking there's because agitation comes before anger, by the way. If you're agitated, buckle up. You're about to go into anger. You may want to throw it in neutral. I'm just I'm not pissed. I'm just just agitated. Oh, don't worry, it's coming. Have you ever tried to pray and uh, when you're angry and it's amazing? God's never home. Never home. Can you believe it just when I needed you most? I cannot access God when I'm furious. Uh, in fact, the direction I was taught and that I teach everybody that I work with is uh, I tell them to focus on a simple word because I'm a simple guy. When you're angry, you shoot for one thing, calm. If you are not calm, don't even bother praying. I don't care what you have to do to achieve that. I don't care if you have to do some push-ups or sit-ups or take a bath or go walk around the block six times with the dog or do whatever. You have to be willing to look bad, be humble, which is aware of your shortcomings, and talk to the people involved who may want to discuss it with you, like a spouse, an employer, or a friend, and say, I cannot do this right now. I am out of control. I need to achieve calm. I cannot do this in your presence. It's not you. It's me. And I need to extricate myself. I need to walk away from you. I promise you, as soon as I am calm and have an opportunity to pray, I will be a different individual, and you'll be grateful you've taken the patience with me. Words are optional, but we learn to be humble. I spent a lot of time fighting with my wife because my ego wouldn't let me tell her I'm angry and I feel out of control. I don't feel like I can hear you right now. I'm trying to pray and listen to you at the same time. It's not working. It makes me feel weak. Can I just go away for 10 minutes? Can you do that for me? The first time I did it, I was almost crying. It was so hard for me to do as a man. And uh, she said, yeah, of course. (laughs) (laughs) So that was it. That was how hard it was, huh, honey? (laughs) Oh, fine. Be more spiritual than me. (laughs) And she is. hate it. Uh... For when harboring such feelings, we cut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit, the insanity of the first drink returns, and we drink. We can't cut ourselves off from the power that we need to live. 
So we find this business of resentment is infinitely grave and does actually have the power to kill. Book goes on to say, well, we, we know these, these resentments have to be mastered, but, but how? How? So in the first part, we understand that we've already, we've already learned how to do some of the process. In fact, we've been doing it our whole life. We know that other people are sometimes quite wrong. Problem is, we've been so good at that part of it that we've added some justification and rationalization to it. And so now we say, although we know we're somewhat to blame, we're quite sure that they're way more to blame. So we don't have a good balance in perception. We are unwilling to look at our part in things. In fact, it says that some of us have never even tried that. We just get pissed, it's you, let's move on. I can change a relationship, a job, a town. That's much easier than trying to change you. And since you're the problem, <laughs> I guess I got to go. We never thought that perhaps we play a part in it. And if we play a part, a part that might actually influence things. Because our part is so small, how could it possibly influence anything? So now we're prepared to look at this in a different way. We understand why we're doing it, because we don't want to die. So we got a good selfish reason now for doing our resentment list. Screw morality, we don't want to die. Screw being a nice guy, we don't want to die. We want to get past this thing. We want to get past these feelings. If you can't be more spiritual than that, that's a terrific reason to learn to master your resentments. I want to be happy and I don't want to die. Those are good things. That's a good punch list. We turn back to the list for it held the key to the future. Okay. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoings of others, fancy to real, had power to actually kill how could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than with alcohol. Now, if, if that doesn't piss you off, I don't know what will. When you find out that the world... Mad Bear, run! God, is that you? Okay, well, we're going to keep moving along while they figure out how much trouble we're in. <laughs> Repeat after me. It was that way when I got here. It was that way when I got here. <laughs> so this whole concept that my sponsor introduced to me through the four-step you know, and they, they, they say the things like this when you talk to me or resentment, they go, well, how does it feel that he's living rent-free in your head? And you start to get the idea that the power that people, places, and things have over us actually dominate our life. Because I was so sure that if the world and the people in it just behaved a certain way, that I'd be okay. And I really believe that. And in AA, I got introduced to the idea that they're not going to change and it's really not about them. It's not the thing, it's my reaction to the thing. And that I let these things outside of myself dominate me. Why do I let the things outside of myself dominate me? Because I got nothing on the inside. And when you got nothing on the inside, you have to find things on the outside to fill you up. And they don't fit. So you acquire more of them. Or you try different ones on. If it's not her, I'll find another her. How funny. She's got the same problems the last one had. I'll find another one. Gee, I guess my picker's broken. And we never start to think that maybe it's us. One of the things that I discovered through the process of the steps that's very interesting to me, and I use this as a, and I don't know if you guys have anything like this in your life, I have certain things that are, I call spiritual barometers, you know, that I kind of see how I'm doing. They're good indications to me of how I'm doing. One of them is sensitivity. I notice if I'm overly sensitive to things around me, people, places, and things, uh, my wife is a great indicator, my employer, uh, guys I sponsor, people I go to meetings with, if I don't have a good sense of humor about myself and my sensitivity's up, it may be an indication there's something going on on the inside I need to deal with. Now, the other part of it is I'm not so interested in acquiring great tools for diagnostic spiritual care. I want to know how can I not have to be out of spiritual maintenance? How do I stay in there? And we all know that the things are suggested in the book that we're going to talk about later, the 10th and the 11th step in particular. But... One of the things that I know is a true thing, that when I am simply doing this, 
going where I say I'm going to go, doing what I say I'm going to do. So there's accountability there. I'm seeking God in my thoughts and actions. I'm trying to live up to my side of the contractual obligation between me and my higher power, where he's, la- he's management, I'm labor. I get to stay sober and have a wonderful life, but there's some simple things I have to do. When those things are hitting on all eight cylinders, almost 100% of the time, I find I have this natural patience and tolerance to things outside of myself. I mean, where... I mean, Clancy uses the example of a traffic jam, which I think is great because we're in L.A., you really get it. He goes, sometimes he leaves work and there's a traffic jam. And he says, oh, traffic jam happens every day. I'll just get home when I get home. And he turns on the radio and he drives home with no problem. Sometimes he gets into the car and he goes, traffic jam. Where do these goddamn people come from? Where'd you learn to drive? Get out of the way. Like there's different types of traffic jams. <laughs> So if I find my reaction to something that I'm constantly being exposed to, if my reactions are different from one day to the next, wife, employer, friends, AA, they're probably not changing. It's probably me, and it's probably an indication of my spiritual being. That I find that when my inside job is right, which means I'm living the way I think God wants me to live, it not only makes me feel good and creates patience and tolerance for me, it actually produces an ability for compassion, understanding, empathy, which what, what does that mean? It means that the rest of God's kids start to materialize in front of me in a real and meaningful manner. Everyone will identify when you've got something going on in your life and somebody around you might have something going on in their life, you can't be there for them. You want to be there, but you got too much stuff going on. You're emotionally disturbed. You have that feeling like, I can't worry about that right now. I've got my own stuff going on. And you feel like you'd be letting yourself down in order to be there for the other person. Yet, when we're in good spiritual condition, we can have stuff going on in our life. And the fact that someone around us might need our help, either spiritually or through support or an activity that we can do for them, we're actually grateful for the opportunity. We go, good, a way to get out of myself. This is wonderful. I don't have to think about myself. We recognize the spiritual opportunity for growth and for service. But when the inside job's out of whack, this thing where it talks about the world and its people really dominate us, we're talking about when we were drinking, but keep in mind that this can be very, very true in recovery. And it's a great indicator if you want to look at that. If you feel like it's their fault, it's a great indicator that maybe there's something wrong with the inside job. And when maybe you're not really living in the third step. And that, that's something I use uh, on a daily basis to really take my temperatures, my sensitivity and my reaction to things around me. Uh, then we go into the bottom of page 66 and 67, uh, what a lot of people call the sick man prayer, uh, which is, uh, it's a, you know, it's very interesting that they're going to lay this on us before we've actually even done our first inventory because this, in my opinion, can be very advanced spiritual stuff. I think conceptually it is. I think it's one of the toughest things that they ask you to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm just being honest with you. This was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way they disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God to help show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. But if we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Uh, one of the things I try to do in my own recovery is is be honest. I mean, really honest, whether I'm in front of a group of men that, you know, my ego's always involved in something like this. I try to get out of the way and go, I don't care. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I have a tremendous amount of trouble doing that. And let me tell you why. This is just for me. It's very dangerous when I get into the the forgiving business or the judgment business. And I understand this is a suggestion because the the idea behind this is we're trying to be introduced to compassion. We're trying to get our thinking to see that, hey, you're right, he's a mess just like you. Here's a mirror. That's what we're really trying to do with this little writing here, is we're trying to get the reader to understand that, yeah, yeah, he's sick, he's messed up, 
just like every human being on the planet is from time to time. And maybe you're not suffering like that at this moment, but I bet you can identify with it if you want to. So maybe we can work on some empathy or compassion. That's great if you're spiritually developed enough to do that. For me, it's very dangerous for me to start going, you're sick. Man, you are messed up. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> sick son of a bitch. <laughs> well, I know you're working your program. Why don't you try working ours? <laughs> very dangerous for a guy like me. It's okay. I'm just used to it. He's looking at me like, son of a bitch. <laughs> Don't make me get up. You're not that big. You'll never see me come and I move like a cat. <laughs> That's great. You see, when you upset me or you offend me, and I go along this line, this is what happens for me. I think you're sick. I'm spiritually better than you. I'm going to pray to God to give me strength to love you, not that you're worth it. I have to go to the creator of the universe because, Jesus, I need that kind of help to love you. And, uh, and there's a, for me, with judgment being such a cornerstone of my old existence, it's difficult for me. Uh, but I'll tell you what does work for me. It says that if we do these things and we hurt somebody and we offend them, we can lose an opportunity to be helpful later. So I look at that as the direction for a guy like me. If I have that much trouble, and I do, getting my ego out of the way when I start judging, when I start condemning other people, I don't want to be in the forgiveness uh, and in the judgment business. I'm just not very good at it. Uh, there, I can't tell you how many men I've met in Alcoholics Anonymous when I first met him was getting to know him. I just couldn't stand him one goddamn little bit. Just like, who is this guy? What a chowderhead, you know? And uh, ended up being great friends and are friends with them this day and love them like brothers, you know, which tells me that my perception of things isn't always accurate. So I don't want to be in the condemning or the forgiving business. We'll leave that to somebody more equipped like God. But what I will ask for the power to do is to serve you. And I've learned a lot of things, particularly in Alcoholics Anonymous. If I have a problem with somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous, I will go out of my way to be extra nice to them. I will sit next to them in a meeting. I will ask them questions about themselves. Because this is my experience. If I can find somebody's humanity, if I can find out who they are, then there's an opportunity for identification, and the identification reduces my judgment. There, there's a quote in my, my first big book that I found somewhere, and I wrote it down, and it's, uh, it's from the author uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. And he said that if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we would find in each man's life enough suffering and pain to disarm all hostility. And that's been my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous and the world in general. People that I haven't really liked very much, I'm not saying that I ended up wanting to have lunch with them or we're going to be best friends, but I certainly had a tolerance that wasn't produced by my initial reaction to them. I had to put some effort into it. I wanted to understand them. I wanted to do what I think God would have me do in that situation. But as for praying for them, uh, I don't know that I need to. And the book's very clear, so I'm not saying not to do it. I'm just saying that I don't do it because it's, it creates more problems for me. It's much easier for me to go, you're sick. I'll just pray for you. And now I've put you in a box. You're a problem. You're not part of the solution for me. I'm spiritual. I'm going to pray for you. But now I don't have to consider you anymore. It's much more difficult for a guy like me to actually try to get to know you and be of service to you. And, uh, and I think... That's, you know, it's very easy to love somebody that's lovable, you know. And uh, Alcoholics Anonymous isn't necessarily filled with lovable people all the time, <laughs> particularly when we're new. Um, I have a couple of friends of mine in, in Bellingham I've become pretty close with, and they're both uh, over 25 years sober. And uh, they have a lot of trouble with the AA population. And they say crazy things like, I, we were all going out to dinner after a meeting one night, and they said, who's going? And I told them, they said, they oh, it's going to be a bunch of new people. I don't, last thing I want to do is have dinner with a bunch of new people after working all week. And I said, really? I go, there's nothing I'd rather do. I said, do you do know we're in Alcoholics Anonymous, don't you? <laughs> and they really get, you know, and they were just, they get tired of, you know, why do newcomers share so much in there? You're just so goddamn. I'm like, they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be. If, if I have a newcomer and he's not annoying and making me crazy, he's probably not being honest. 
Because I was annoying and crazy when I was new. I expect that out of new people. It makes me feel like we're connecting, like maybe we're getting down to the root of the problem. So just some stuff to think about. So now we're going to do, we're going to take the action. We're going to do the big spiritual lifting here. We're going to refer to our list again, and we're going to put out of our minds the wrongs that are done. We're going to resolutely look for our own mistakes. And they're going to give us how we're going to look. We're going to look to see where we've been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. And though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we're going to try to disregard the other person involved entirely, and we're going to find out where we were to blame because the inventory is ours, not the other man's. We're going to see our faults through this process. They're going to become apparent to us. We're not going to have to search very hard is what's telling us. It says, when we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly, and we're willing to set these matters straight. Now, there's a lot of information there. We're not just listing our part in it in the fourth column. We're going to admit them honestly, which means you get to own it. So when you write that in the fourth column, you're, you're, you're telling yourself the truth about yourself. You're looking at the truth. So you have to own that. It's now yours forever. So now you own it. And while you write it down and you look at what you are, you have to be willing to make it right, whether that's through changing or how that affected the people on that line in your column, what you're going to do about making that right. So there's a lot of surrender going on in those two lines. Big time surrender. Now we go to the, uh, we're done with our fourth column, our first inventory. We're going to move on to our fear inventory. And uh, it, it is as simple as it seems. I know people uh, have been disappointed in the fear inventory. I've seen some of the workbooks that are out, and uh, I guess they want to make the fear inventory uh, more meaty, and it doesn't need to be. Uh, we analyze our fears. We list them down on paper what they are. Uh, you'll find as you do inventories with men and as you do your old inventories, and I know this is, there's nothing really unique there. It's the typical stuff, you know. I'm not big enough, smart enough, fast enough. I'm, you know, I'm not going to be enough. I'm, I'm above the pile. I'm below the pile. My dick's too big. My dick's too small. It's whatever, you know. It's just, it's, it's all the same stuff, but it's all fear. It's all self-centered fear. It's all produced by my over-involvement with myself, and I'm so concerned with myself that that's all I think about. And when I look at any problem that closely, it, of course, becomes larger. Of course, it becomes magnified. And I live my whole life this way, trying to figure out if I measure up, do I fit in? So, of course, I have these fears. I get them down in black and white, and I analyze why I have them. And the book is really simple about that. It asks us a question. Well, isn't it because self-reliance failed you? What do you think about that? I mean, self-reliance is good as it goes, who says that, but it fails us. It doesn't go far enough, not with people like us. So we can have great abilities, and some of us have these great, you know, have accomplished things in our life, and we have great abilities, and it makes it tough when you get in there to say, wait a minute, you know, I'm not some loser. You know, I've done some things in my life, and we're not saying that you're a loser. We're saying self-reliance is terrific, but it doesn't go far enough. And how about if we have something to offer you that's better than self-reliance? Would you be interested in that? Well, yeah. Great. How about we trust infinite God rather than our finite selves? As talented as you are, do you think there might be an end to your abilities, an end to what you do, an end to your intelligence, an end to your ability to help others on your own? Of course. Well, why not trust infinite God rather than your finite self? How about this? How about we add a new question to your mental arsenal that you've always asked? All your life, you've asked yourself some basic questions. What do I want to be? What does she want me to be? What do they want me to be? What does society want me to be? What does mom want me to be? What does dad want me to be? What does the boss want me to be? And we ask all these questions for one reason only. I want what I want when I want it. If I can figure out what they want from me, I give them what they want, then you owe me. Because I don't know how to love, I know how to barter. I know cause and effect. If I do these things, society says that if I do them, I'll be happy. I'll do them, but I better get what I want or I lose faith in things human because I'm not doing them with the right motives. My motives are not to love. My motives are not to serve. My motives are to serve self. So I ask these questions. What do I want to be? What do they want me to be? What does she want me to be? What does society want me to be? I've never asked the question, what would God have me be? Never. I've been willing to take actions based on that question. In the fear inventory, we find a solution to how we outgrow fear. How do we do it? We start asking one question. We turn our thoughts to what he would have us be at once. It means immediately. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. 
Phenomenal. So simple. I saw a workbook. It had 22 pages on this. Screwing up newcomers, killing them dead. But that's just an opinion. <laughs> Keep it simple. If I spend a little bit more time, here's the deal. All I do is think about myself endlessly. If I can spend a little less time thinking about myself and a little bit more time thinking about God and his kids, my life's going to start to change. If I do that, I'm going to feel that change and I'm going to like it. I'm going to feel power flow in. I'm going to feel a new happiness. And I'm going to become interested in this new way of thinking and new way of acting. So I'm going to become a little less interested in myself, a little more interested in you. I'm not going to do that because I'm moral. I'm going to do that because it makes me feel better. And you have to pay attention to these things. It's essential that when we do these things, pay attention. The word values comes into play here. If we're going to do an inventory and get rid of the unsaleable goods, which are the things in our life that don't work, we cannot fool ourselves about values. What makes you feel good? What fills the whole? What makes the inside job complete? What makes you feel like you're moving in the right direction? What makes you feel purposeful? Pay attention to those things. Pay attention to your life with God and your life without God. Pay attention. And if you have the experience of most people in Alcoholics Anonymous, what you'll find out is when you fill your life with God and you simply try to ask yourself these new questions, what would God have me be? And take actions based on that answer. You feel better and you start to realize that this is the true path to happiness. You know, we find that unsuspected inner resource, that unused muscle is there, coiled like a snake, ready to work. It's been ready the whole time. Alcoholics, in my understanding of the men that I've, we are deeply spiritual people that live deeply unspiritual lives. So we are naturally in conflict. But we are people that are when introduced to the God idea and start to implement it in our lives on a daily basis. That is why our recovery can be so spectacular. That's why we can rise out of such misery and bad repute and bad, re bad reputation and become active members of society and purposeful in the lives of others. It's not because we're great. It's because we have a great capacity to love God and be loved by God and to take these spiritual tenets and live by them. We have a natural ability to do it. We've just never done it. And our mind, because the problems in our mind, our mind is trying to kill us by telling us that God is not the path. So we have to do these exercises and we have to get down in black and white what's true and what the real value in things are. So we go to our sponsor when we do our fist step and I'll get into that with the fear thing and we very basically, it's the same answer. When we write the column, what would we do instead? It's real simple. It's the same answer. Think on, think on what God would have me be and try to live that way. It's the same answer. We, we at once commence to outgrow fear doesn't say that once we're without fear. It says we commence to outgrow it. Fear is an active part of my life on a daily basis. I had fear driving up the hill to meet you guys. I had fear last night before I spoke. I had fear this morning before I spoke. I have fear. I'll have fear when I come home to see what chores I have to do. Uh, you know, fear is an active part of my life. What I do with the fear and my understanding of it and its power in my life are completely different. Because I really do believe that the fear is the boogeyman in my life. Because what I keep finding out over and over and over again in recovery is most of the bad stuff that I worry about never happens to me. And most of the bad stuff that does happen to me, I never see coming. So why worry? Because I don't know where it's coming from. Okay. Now we're on to uh, bottom of page 68. This is where all the newcomers wake up in the book studies. <laughs> now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there. Really? But above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. Uh, some of the things I highlighted from the sex inventory, we all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. When you read the big book, it's helpful if... Every time you crack it open to believe it, to read it, that you believe that the book is written for you. And then if you read it with the premise that everything in it's true, whether you want to believe it or not, you know, just, okay, all this is true, and if I don't believe it's true when I read it, I have to work at that understanding. There's some, really, there's some stuff in here that's really going to help us as men. 
We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. See, that's important that we understand that. It takes away the embarrassment. It takes away the isolationism. It takes away the inability or it takes away the inability to talk to another man about these things. I know men that have suffered for great lengths of time in sobriety with issues, sexual issues, in their marriage or in their life, and they weren't talking to anybody about it because of embarrassment, because they thought their case was different, because they said, I can't tell them that, they'll laugh at me. Now, we all know sitting here as men in this room, if a man came to you and had enough faith and trust in you to share intimately something that was going on in his bedroom, you would never abuse that privilege. I know I wouldn't. You would understand because we have been men, when we've all had sexual problems, we'd hardly be human if we didn't, what an honor and a privilege that is to carry that. Now, now that we understand what an honor and a privilege that is to carry that, when a man comes to us, we have to be willing to carry that to other, we have to be willing to carry our own stuff to other men. Because our lives change in sobriety. Sometimes we come in and we don't have any sexual problems because we're not having sex. It's hard to have sexual problems when it's just you and you. So... uh, (laughs) No problem at all, you know. <laughs> you know, and then you meet the girl in sobriety and you fall in love and then you have sexual problems. But hey, that could be three, four years in sobriety. I've done an inventory. You know, and I kind of glanced around with it with my sponsor. And I mean, that's why we continue to take personal inventory in the 10th step. And that's where these things are addressed. But the principle I want to talk about here is what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if you're a good enough member of Alcoholics Anonymous that you would honor a man's truth with you, then you have to be willing to take that risk of faith and share your truth with another man because we're only as sick as our secrets. And we can't get better because we don't work on problems we don't have. Nobody in this room has ever worked on a problem they didn't have. So keep that in mind. So the book gives us that, lets us know, and it gives us the, uh, the way that we're going to evaluate our sexual conduct. And we're going to ask ourselves some questions. We're going to want to know where we've been selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate, We want to list the name of who we've hurt, and we want to ask ourselves the question, what would we have done instead? We got this all down on paper, and we looked at it. It's a very simple process. We subjected each relationship to the test. Was it selfish or not? So you put down the person you're in a relationship with. You ask those questions about them. Circle the ones that the answer is yes to, because for most of us, it's yes, yes, yes. I've been selfish and considerate. You know, have I aroused jealousy or suspicion? Yes, yes. You know, subjected to the test, was I selfish or not? I was selfish. And the big thing is, what would you do instead? Now, picture that life is nothing but a conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt is in the shape of a circle. And this conveyor belt will bring you the same stuff over and over again in your life. And it will bring you the things that life brings you, good, bad, happy, or sad. And when something good comes by, don't get fixed on it because you might miss the bad thing coming up. And if it's bad, don't get too worried about it. Something good could be coming by And it'll keep coming and it'll keep changing. That's just the nature of life. But bet your bottom dollar, it's coming around again. And because we know that, we're able to do this kind of inventory work. And the book tells us in this way, we're going to try to shape a sound, insane idea about our future sex lives. So you don't look at your selfishness and your failures in your personal relationships and go, I'm a bad person. That's not the purpose. You may be a bad person. You may have acted in a way that you wish you hadn't. I certainly did. I had a great deal of remorse and guilt about the way that I acted in intimate relationships. It was horrible. But I was taught not to look at that and not to beat myself up. But to focus on the last column in that process, what am I going to do instead? Because I'm going to have another chance. There's going to be another her, and I can do it differently this time, but I better understand how I was before. And I better be able to write down what it looks like to act differently. How would God have me act in that relationship? What does that look like? On page 85 in the book, when we get into the 11th step, it'll talk about each day is a day we must carry a vision of God's will into all our activities. It's all our activities. Vision. You have to be able to see what you're going to do before you do it. You know, visualization is not a new technique came up in the new sports era. I mean, this... This is what Bill talked about with his relationship with God, was being able to see God's will. So you have to be able to see how you look acting the way God made you to be. And if you do that, if you try that exercise, how do I look like? What do I look like when I'm being kind to my wife? What do I look like when I'm being an attentive spouse? What do I look like? If you close your eyes, you'll see that guy, and you can be that guy. Because here's the beauty of life. You are what you do, not what you think. 
So now we finished our four step. And the book's going <laughs> to, I love this. It's going to tell us some stuff. And if we can't agree with this, then we need to look at our four step again before we go to our fifth step. It says, if we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we've written down a lot. We have analyzed, we have listed and analyzed our resentments. And that's important. That means that you've done some thinking about this stuff before you go to your fifth step. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance and patience and goodwill towards all men, even our enemies, for we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct, and we are willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again, the faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are now convinced that God can remove from you whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. If you have already made a decision, third step, and an inventory of your gross or handicaps, fourth step, you have made a good beginning. So you're up to a good beginning at this point. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. So if you read that, that's at the end of how it works, on page 70 it starts, and you don't identify with that, there's instructions here. These are things that by this point in the fourth step that we should have completed, which means we should have analyzed our resentments. We should have began to learn tolerance and patience and goodwill towards men, even our enemies. So we have some empathy that's entered into our life. We've listed the people that have been hurt by our conduct, and we're willing to straighten out the past if we can. So, wow, we're not even close to the eighth or the ninth step, are we? But we're already willing. So when we wrote down our fourth column in that resentment list, we didn't just write our part in it. We wrote that we were willing to set it right. We started working the process of eight and nine when we wrote the fourth column in the resentment portion of the inventory and in the fourth column of the sexual inventory and when we wrote what God would have us do instead in the fear portion of the inventory. So it's very important that you read this and you go, have I done that? And it doesn't take long to ask yourself those questions. And it doesn't take long. It's always okay before you move on to the next step to always review. Am I ready to do this? And if you don't know, that's what a sponsor's for. Absolutely. You know? And I hope as sponsors that we're doing this stuff with our guys. That we're not giving them pages to read and assignments to do. Hell, have them come over. Watch the ball game. Have them sit in the corner and do some writing. Say, if you have a question, ask me. I'll be right here enjoying my life. <laughs> So try to keep the weeping down. (laughs) Step five. So we've made our personal inventory. Now what do we do? Fifth step in the uh, process, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs principle here at work is integrity. Interesting word for alcoholics. Why are we doing this with another human being? Well, the book tells us on page 72, we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. Many of us thought it necessary to go much further. We will be more reconciled to discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reasons why we should. Best reason first, if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their life. Trying to avoid this humbling experience, they have turned to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. Best reason first, you do your fifth step. Once again, take your self-centeredness, make it work for you. I don't want to die drunk. It's a terrific reason to do your fifth step. Terrific reason to promote that to the guys that you sponsor. Well, I don't really want to do this. You're right. You should probably die in a pool of urine. How's that? Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it. All right. There's a humility involved with doing your fist step because what you're going to do is you're going to take the curtain and the film that you've always had in front of your life to try to make yourself look the way you think you want people to perceive you. And for one time with one man, you're going to sit down and you're going to let him see you exactly as you are. Page 73, it explains who we are. It says, more than most people, more than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. He is very much the actor. Through the outer world, he presents his stage character. 
This is the one he wants his fellows to see. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but in his heart, he knows he doesn't deserve it. Goes on to say at the bottom of page 73 and beginning of 74, if we were to be entirely honest with somebody, if we were to expect to live long or happily in this world, rightly and naturally, we would think well before we choose the person or persons to whom to take this intimate and confidential step. Those of us belonging to a religious denomination which requires confession must, and of course, will want to go to the properly anointed authority whose duty it is to receive it. Though we have no religious connection, we may still do well to talk with somebody ordained by an established religion. We often find such a person quick to see and understand our problem. Of course, we sometimes encounter people who do not understand alcoholics. Yeah, every now and then. And uh, <laughs> the, reason, the reason I thought I'd read that for you, there's a, you know, I was in a, my men's meeting, which meets at St. James Church on 14th Street in uh, the Fairhaven section of Bellingham on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. It's the SOS men's group. Uh, if you're in town, we'd love to have you there. We start at 7 o'clock. We make strong coffee, and uh, it's a good meeting. But uh, there was a guy, and he was sharing, you know, and he kind of went on a little rant about organized religion, and he was really upset about it. And I was sitting there listening to him. He's a nice guy and all, and I'm, and I'm thinking, wow, we're sitting in a church. <laughs> And I think half the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous in the world are probably head in, held in church basements. And the truth is the religious communities have been very, very kind to Alcoholics Anonymous over the years. And in our own literature, we don't have any problem with religious people. Another part in our literature said many of us return to the churches of our youth. Not all of us favor such denominations, but many do. And I think it's important that if we're going to lose, if we're going to practice love and tolerance as our code, that's everybody. And just because we're in a spiritual movement, we don't need... See, I know where that comes from. It comes from fear. You know, you know, it's okay. It's okay that somebody has an answer that works for them that isn't your answer. Be grateful you found something here, but don't think that your answer is better than theirs. And we have to remember that when we talk about religious people. You know, I know that when I got sober and I was in my spiritual infancy, uh, I was very judgmental of, you know, suddenly I'm on fire with God and... Uh, you know, I remember talking to my sponsor, and I'm getting sober in my sister's house where I finished my drinking, and I'm talking about how she has no spiritual life, you know? And, uh, and I said, I don't even know if she believes in God. You know, I'm really worried about her. And uh, he says, is this the same sister who saved your life? <laughs> so let me get this straight. She went to work, held a job, raised a family, saved your sorry ass, but now you've got a couple of months of God under your belt, and you're going to tell her how to live? You may want to hold off on that, Sparky. <laughs> you know, it's like I talk about the guy with the flat tire. I mean, we're the ones that drove by for half a mile doing the 10 step before he made the U-turn to go help him change the tire, you know. Religious folk just pulled over. They've been doing it longer than us. And, uh, you know, I look at a place like this today, and, you know, thank God for religious folk who have love and tolerance and are showing us how to be loving and tolerant. Because, you know, I sometimes look at these nice, beautiful churches that we're in, and you should see the one we're in for our men's groups. Unbelievable. we got the solarium room with a view of the bay. It's just phenomenal. And you should see some of the guys going this meeting. we got new guys, you know what I mean? We have a big sign. It's this big in front of the, our podium that says, no cussing. And, I mean, we have to grab it and, like, shake it at people. And we're in a church, and there's church groups in there, and they're firing F-bombs like they're throwing Frisbees at a rock concert. <laughs> You know, we got the blue-haired little old lady weaver group there once a month, and we have to make announcements. The weavers are here, so please, please stop scaring the ladies, you know. You know, we got guys with, you know, death tattooed on their forehead, and these poor ladies just want to go in and work on their loom. They've been so loving and tolerant to us, so I want to keep in mind. We're going to sit down with our sponsor, and we have the directions on what we're going to do. And the directions are on page 75. It says, we pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. And then we're going to get the fifth step promises. It says, once we have taken this step, withholding nothing. So there's your criteria. You don't get this if you've held anything back. We read a portion of chapter 5 at every meeting that says, half measures availed us nothing. Well, that's just not fair. You know, most things in life, you put in 60%, you get 60% out. You know, I, hey, I, I built a pretty good business career running on 70% effort. You know what I mean? I did okay. 
And, uh, but not in AA. They're telling us half measures availed us nothing. And they're telling us that once we do this withholding nothing, we'll get this. We are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Now, I always make sure that when I talk to my guys about that, I, sit, I tell them about the light switch. Don't think that you're going to do your fist up, you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to experience this. It's going to happen. It could take a couple of years to happen. There's a lot of stuff being promised there. It's not going to happen at all. I did my first uh, fist step probably uh, at the nine-month mark, maybe earlier than that. And uh, I remember it was probably over two years sober when I was, uh, by this time I'd moved out of my sister's, thank God, and I had my own little place. And I'd come home from a meeting, and uh, I didn't have the TV on, and I didn't have the radio on, and I was just sitting on the couch, and there was nothing going on. It was just quiet. And I felt fine. And I thought, wow, I'm alone at perfect peace and ease. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you know? I always had to have the radio on, you know, banging a hammer on the floor. We can't be quiet. That's when the voices come, you know. <laughs> so sleeping with the radio on, you know. So, I mean, sometimes this stuff comes, comes uh, you know, but these promises, they, all, they, they, they come. But keep in mind, you're in a process now. If you stop the process at any point, you know, you're going to discover the Judas step. You know, there's a Judas step contained in 12 steps. It's a step that's going to betray you. And it's always a step that you think doesn't apply to you. That's the one that's going to trip you up. I don't care what it is. It's different for different people. You know, there are some that are more obvious than others. A lot of people get through the fifth step and they go, and they're done. And that, that's kind of obvious what happens there. But keep in mind, we got to get through the process, and then we got to get into 10, 11, and 12 and put some effort into there to do the maintenance and learn how to live so we can stay there. Because we're talking about a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. How do we maintain our spiritual condition? 10-step inventory, 11-step inventory, 11-step seeking God in our thoughts and actions, 12-step working with other alcoholics. If we're not doing these things, we're not doing the maintenance work to keep that spiritual experience in place and to enjoy that daily reprieve. Of course, that doesn't mean if you miss a day, you get drunk. That's the good news. You know, it would send a large, a really strong message to the rest of us though, but uh, that's not the way it works. You know, usually people leave recovery in a very, very gentle fashion. They can waltz away from the answer. They dance away from the answer and you watch them do it. And you make little comments like, Hey, I haven't seen you around. You're doing okay. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just busy with work, you know, and they just get, far enough away from the herd and far enough away from the process and falling away from the answer, it's like wolves never attack the pack. And it seems our alcoholism turns on us in that way. It waits till we're far enough away from the strength of the unit, from the process, from the steps, from God, from our friends, from what is recovery. Then it makes a run at us, you know. I've never seen people working the steps and sponsoring people and going to meetings and in this process. And I'm not talking about just being in an AA, in in AA, but in the process, I've never seen anybody get drunk. I've seen people get drunk who were going to meetings and, but weren't doing any of this. But it's almost invariably you don't see them for a while and then they got drunk, you know. But there's a lot more than just not going to meetings that's part of that equation. I think you can not go to meetings and be in the process. And as long as you're working with other alcoholics, you're probably going to be okay. And there's some people that do that because their life isn't so situated that they can get to the regular meetings. But they work a very strong program. They work with other alcoholics. And you just don't see them a lot in the rooms. And I've seen people, you see them every day in the rooms, they get drunk because they were never in the process because this is the recovery. So we sit down, we do this, we share this with our sponsor, all this information, withholding nothing. Uh, I'll, I'll share my personal experience with it. Uh, so it sounds like when I read the book, it sounded like to me I was going to do my fist step, and I had been listening really clearly to what people shared about the fist step in meetings. And it sounded like I was going to be really happy because they were happy. Oh, I just feel like a full-fledged member of AA now, and I just, you know, really feel like I've earned my seat here. And i got to tell you, you know, I feel like a 5,000-pound weight's been taken off my shoulders, and I just, you know, feel so close to God. And I was like, man, this is going to be great. So I do my fist step, and I want to kill myself, you know, and because uh, I had, like, an honest fist step, and, I mean, I did not live a principled moral life. 
Uh, and it was all in there, you know, line after line after line after line of just crappy living, just embarrassing, pitiful, taking advantage of God's kids, hurting everyone that had the misfortune of caring about me in black and white. And I got done. I was just like, what a dirt ball. But I was so grateful to be in AA and have a chance to get past this. I was actually, I couldn't wait to get into six, seven, eight, and 9 because of my fist step. But it didn't make me feel better. I'll tell you what made me feel better. Six, seven, eight, and nine. My fist step kind of introduced me to the beast, you know, because it just stripped away all the justification and all the rationalization. Like, you know, you're reading your fist step and you want to say this to your sponsor. Uh, let me explain this first. You know, <laughs> there was a lot of stuff like that. He was like, just read it. You sure? You know. He had really good facial control, too. I had a couple. I just thought he was going to go. But he didn't, you know, he didn't. He didn't fall asleep and he didn't freak out, so that was great. After our fifth step, it says we return home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, and in that hour, we don't just sit and twiddle our thumbs. We're going to do some review work. We're going to look at the step work we've done to that point, and we're going to make sure that we, we're looking for honesty. We're looking for thoroughness. We're going to make sure that we weren't given the third step lip service, and if, we, if there's that thing, that thing that we knew we weren't going to write, you know, in the fourth step, so we didn't. And we knew we weren't going to share it in the fifth step, so we didn't. But now we're ready to move forward, and we're feeling that gnawing thing. And, uh, you know, you may want to pick up the phone, and maybe it's years since you did your fifth step or the last one, and that thing still hasn't been told. Here's the beauty about the truth. The truth is a cork. You can take it to the bottom of the ocean. You can bury it with rocks. I guarantee you the, the truth will always come to the surface. It may take years. But you can deal with it on your terms or you can deal with it when you least expect it. But I don't want to walk hand in hand with the past. So I, you know, I got the worst things I had down, the things I was going to take to the grave, and I put them down first. And I just got them out of the way. Not because I'm moral, but because I don't want to live in the past. And before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was walking every day with stuff that had happened years earlier, and I couldn't shake it. It was with me in the room every, every day. And if nothing else, what the inventory process did is it allowed my past to become my past. It didn't alleviate me from the obligation to finish my step work and clean those things up, but it wasn't choking me out every day. I was able to look at those things and realize they had happened, and I started to take some, some action to make those things right to the best of my ability with God's help. And that was a huge thing. That's the lightness that the fifth step produced for me because it started to make sense of this crazy, chaotic life. And with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, a sponsor's direction and loving God, I now had a purposeful direction to go through for the future in terms of how to deal with it. Because here's the warning that I'm going to give you, and this isn't in the big book, but this is my experience and my opinion, so do what you want with it. If you finish your fifth step and you've done a good one and you don't go to six, seven, eight, and nine, be very, very careful because it immediately gets taken from what it is, which is part of a spiritual process, which is highly important, and it slams it into another category called self-knowledge. And you've taken this tool that can become the blueprint for the future and the key way, and you've slammed it into self-knowledge. Because what you've really done, like the book said, is what? You've digested some large chunks of truth about yourself. Well, in my case, if I didn't follow this up by action, I would have drank. Because the large chunks of truth that I digested about myself confirmed what my biggest fear was. I was a loser. That I was a taker. I was a user. It was all there in black and white. And if I didn't do things to clean that up and to change, I was going to drink again. Because that self-knowledge, I drank a lot of whiskey trying to push that self-knowledge down to the bottom before I got here. And now I'm in AA and all that knowledge comes to the top and it really makes it to the top in the fifth step. Me, God, my sponsor, me crying like a baby about these things I did, feeling the remorse like I can't even tell you. I had to get, keep going with the rest of the steps or I would have drank. I know that because that self-knowledge would have availed me nothing and it would have led me back to a drink. So we review the work up to this point. We ask ourselves some questions before we move forward. Is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? If we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Here's a six-step question. Are we now ready to let God remove from us 
All the things which we have admitted are objectionable. Can he now take them all? Every one? That's the question. If you can answer yes, you're on your way. But think about that question before you answer yes. If we still cling to something, we will not let go. We ask God to help us be willing. Sixth step is written, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Principle is acceptance. There's nothing in that step. There's nothing hinted to, alluded to, anything that says anything but all. It's everything. It, it's a blanket deal. So if you're not ready to give up two of them, you got a problem. That's okay. The book's telling us it's okay but you got to pray to be willing to give those things up. You have to know what your character defects are. I have my guys make a six-step list. That's not suggested in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I just know from my own experience it was hard to really understand what I'm doing. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my problems. I'm considering its three common manifestations in the inventory process. What are the big things that came out of that? Victimization. I'm a victim. Pessimism. I'm a pessimist. I'm a victim and a pessimist, which means the glass is half empty and it's your fault. (laughs) I have a belief in God, but I don't have a belief in God that works. I'm fear-based. I use God like a chain brake on an automobile. I take bad actions in sobriety. I get my life roaring like a locomotive. I I reach to God. I pull the chain brake, and it works every time. I have to look at that as a character defect because I want to learn that maybe if I can add God to my thoughts and actions on a more consistent basis at that point in my recovery, I can keep the locomotive from getting out of control. Wouldn't that be nice? So I have an idea what my character defects are. I'm judgmental. I'm slothful. I'm envious. I'm lustful. I mean, you know, seven deadly sins go on there. But I got them down. So I understand what I'm going to God. I want to have an understanding what I'm asking for. Am I entirely ready to have these? Am I really? All of them? Everything? I think so. 